Hello, this is Andrew Just, and I'm speaking to you today about the version 7 release of Forecast Builder. So in this presentation, we're going to discuss a little bit of introduction to version 7 and why um, there's a lot of changes with this. Regarding those changes, we'll look at the impacts to you, the user, as well as some of the changes to configuration, and also to look at the various precipitation type techniques that are available in Forecast Builder version 7. So let's talk a little bit about version 7. Um, as Forecast Builder has grown nationally, you know, initially started in, in Central Region, but is now expanded beyond, um, we've required an overhaul of the underlying code. Um, what we had in place was, as Forecast Builder was growing a lot of band-aids uh, in previous versions. We also wanted to bring in the use of Python dictionaries before it was a lot of just variables. And now this is may more than the technical side, but this was something that was definitely needed to help uh, simplify and organize the code a little bit better. Also to allow for regional configurations, um, we, in this release we now have an actual configuration file for called Forecast Builder Regional Config, and this is where each regional um, each region has the ability to put their policy in place into this uh, configuration file. And this also makes things simpler for you, the forecast office, when it comes to configuration. Also to the, give the ability to utilize the MBM 3.2 precipitation types, um, previously Forecast Builder did not utilize any of the MBM um, precipitation types, so this will be new, for, again, for 3.2, because 3.2 has a lot of advantages when it comes to precipitation type, and we'll discuss that uh, later in the presentation. We also need to expand, uh, or at least provide the capability to expand into other service programs like Fire Weather Marine and Tropical. Um, version 6 had some stuff in there for Fire Weather, but it was very crude. Um, this now is the first really attempt to get into expanding into that program, and will also make um, moving into other programs such as Marine and Tropical a little easier. And again, along with the big overhaul of underlying code, there were a few changes needed to the look and feel for the user, and we'll go through those. And I should note that the previous version will still exist for now. It's going to be renamed, titled Forecast Builder underscore old, located underneath the GFE populate menu. So here's some of the user look and feel changes. The foundation grid step is probably one of the ones that had the biggest amount of change. And how it looks is going to depend on the configuration of the precipitation type approach. What I've shown here on the right is an example of the top-down or Burgoyne uh, configured for the precip type method. You can see the p-type uh, p-type approach referenced here with the max whip of aloft probably freeze and prob ice present, which is the top-down. This step has been expanded to include the environmental grids, which I just referenced. Uh, as well as the fire weather parameters. Again, both of these are con um, de depend on how the forecast builder is configured. Note during the population, um, it, where the MBM data, because again, forecast builder is delivering the MBM, where it's three hourly, the grids are not interpolated by default. That is configurable. You can have it uh, interpolate. But whether you do or not, it should be noted that finalize will interpolate for you. So if we look at the foundation grid step for switching to using snow level and prob ice present as a configure p-type method, you see the menu is a little shorter, uh, or the GUI, and then uh, you just have the two parameters there. And then if you switch and use MBM as the precipitation type method, you see the four probabilities of type, rain, freezing rain, snow, and sleet depicted in the GUI. At the conclusion of the foundation grid step, there are a few options available to you. The first uh, is similar to what we had in previous versions, the option for diurnal. Um, I should note, you should exercise caution, especially in non-diurnal situations. Diurnal can produce some odd artifacts. Then you also have an option here to create a preview of the weather grid. Um, and that's, again, using in this case, because I had it configured as top-down, that's the option that it shows here is top-down. And you can also create a preview of the snowmonk grid. So these, these two options of creating weather and 
snow amount as a preview is nice so that you don't have to go all the way through the process. You can actually just, hey, what does it look like based on what I have the foundation grids as of as of now? This was a uh, many offices had requested this type of feature. So with the precipitation types and accumulation grid step, there's a few changes here. The biggest biggest one here is that the options for shower and stratiform, as well as rain and drizzle, have moved on to the weather creation step. And the background behind that is that the National Blend of Models, when it provides precipitation type probabilities, the only ones it has are rain, snow, sleet, and freezing rain. So not, no shower, no drizzle. So we push those off to the weather, weather creation. This, this helps when we actually set the Configure it when we configure the p-type approach as NBM and talk about configuring it as NBM if you have it that way This whole config this whole precip type te Step is, will not appear this GUI because you're already saying hey, I'm I'm using the NBM p-types So it will just automatically generate the snow and ice amount for you And then for the weather creation step, this GUI uh, is definitely larger because, like I mentioned before, the shower stratiform and rain drizzle have been moved to that to the step, and you can see that here in the bottom of the GUI. There's also another part of the GUI that's worth noting is these options to simplify weather grids. There's been a, a, f a few additions with inside Forecast Builder code to help prevent reaching that 256 weather key um, problem. Uh, especially for offices that are dealing with a lot of mixed precipitation types. This is a common occurrence to try and hit that 256. Should those fail, um, you'll, you'll get a banner that, say, that says, hey, we need to reduce the number of weather keys. So you can do that in a multiple number of ways. Uh, one would be is to simplify some of your non-precipitating types, go with straight up shower or stratiform for all of your weather grids, go with all all rain or all drizzle for all your precip all your um, all your grids for weather, but if you know if you have to leave those alone, then go into these options to simplify weather grids. And I think one of those that you might um, utilize uh, a lot, um, or actually the two, would be the snow light precipitation intensity. So this would basically make make anything either mod the M or the plus which in the grand scheme of things doesn't really matter when it comes to either NDFD, ZFP. You just won't, rather than light rain, you'll just get rain, which for all intents and purposes isn't a whole lot different. And then there's also this use max coverage for multiple weather types. And so in this scenario, it'd be something like you'd have, let's say likely snow, chance freezing rain, slight chance sleet. Um, they'll all be considered likely because um, likely was the highest coverage. So that helps reduce, again, the number of weather keys. So again, there's stuff that's put, built into Forecast Builder to help reduce the number of weather keys. These options are available. There's other tips and tricks, like I mentioned, with Stratiform Shower, Rain Drizzle, just to keep everything the same that you can apply to help prevent the 256 key issue. With respect to configuration, again, there's significant changes made. Um, we have a ba basically now a baseline, a regional, and a local um, configuration. So the baseline is what's going to be built in the Forecast Builder utility file. That's where we're going to try and keep things like that are national policies, things that might be holding pretty close to what you would see in 10-201 for the national, national directive. And then you have the regional policies, and these might be what are set by RLC agreements, um, things like that. And so they are stored in various sections, CR configuration, which I have shown here on the right. And then there's stuff for you know, Western region, Southern region, Eastern, et cetera. And then finally, you have a local configuration that's in, uh, in your forecast builder config file. And it's noteworthy that all these utilize Python. That's a change really from what we have before. The, the one and from Forecast Builder 6 and prior were just simple. Hey, here's a variable um, name like extended QPF snow ice equal to true. That's it. Now we actually can incorporate various Python methods in here, which is very helpful. And a case here in point is that in CR, we have defined areas of our own region here that have um, specific p-type techniques that they want to utilize. Again, reference here the Forecast Builder v7 documentation for more details. 
So finally here, we're going to talk a little bit about precipitation type. As you have seen um, through this presentation, version 7 contains several options for the precip precip type approach. And again, this is really just to handle a lot of the various local and regional grid policies. And I must say, handling all these policies creates a whole lot of code um, for version 7. Um, the ver there are positives and negatives to each technique, and we'll detail that here on the next slide. Uh, and we need to note that, you know, if you have a group of offices that are doing one technique and another group of offices doing another technique, it's possible to see issues in consistency with snow amount, ice accumulation, weather. So that's just something to be aware of. Over time, um, the hope is that we can reduce the number of techniques and ultimately get to the MBM as that technique. Um, but that will take, again, some time here as we see how the MBM is performing with P-type. So let's talk a little bit about performance of various precipitation type uh, approaches that are in Forecast Builder version 7. So I kind of try to delineate this based on both looking at the, at the science versus the technique. So um, the first column um, there about number of models versus MBM, uh, you might ask why, why do I get into, need to include this column because we're all these precipitation type approaches are all basically MBM, except for the one, which is a Burgoyne test bed that we uh, in CR uh, has been running um, for the eastern part of the region. Uh, unfortunately, there's very few, and so you could end up with a consi um, consistency issue between what your the rest of your grids say and what the Burgoyne P-types have, especially in the extended, where we're pretty much down to some, you know, what comes into AWIS, which is Canadian and um, Canadian, the GFS. Uh, regarding computed correctly, the top-down uh, routine is really only the max weppable loft only, max weppable loft because it has a range from um, negative infinity to infinity. If you look at the look at it from a mathematical perspective, on the other hand, elements like prob ice present and prob refree sleet um, have bounds of zero to one hundred. So sometimes during the blending process, you can create maybe a scenario that's not entirely um, physically possible. Uh, handling nar narrow warm coal layers, uh, that's something that's an advantage of the Burgoyne and that Burgoyne is implemented in MBM 3.2 um, for, th for that. So that's why you see that as, as a big yes for the Burgoyne options. Accounts for environment uncertainty. This is an interesting one because all the approaches that we've had built into Forecast Builder up to this point, um, and even here what you see in display in version 7, top-down, Burgoyne, snow level, they all take the idea of we're going to take all the, the parameters like max weppable law, for example, or snow level, we're going to blend them across all the different um, data sets that we have provided and come up, you get one number. Well, that doesn't really help you dictate what is the whole distribution doing. Um, in fact, if we go to the last column about bimodal, you could have one group of scenarios that favors, say, a snow sounding, let's say the max, max wet bulbs below zero, and you have another group of scenarios that favor a more liquid, be it rain or freezing rain, and that's, say, a max wet bulb off to four. You take those two, two groups, you take them, divide them, you know, take the middle approach of that, and you end up with two, which favors a somewhere like a snow, sleet, freezing rain mix. So, and that's neither, neither scenario is going to happen on bimodal. It's either going to be snow or it's going to be a, a rain or freezing rain, depending on the surface temperature. So, um, that's one of the problems with some of the approaches currently. MBM 3.2 doesn't have that problem. MBM 3.2, what it does is it looks at looks at every member and comes up with the precipitation type um, probabilities for rain, snow, sleet, and freezing rain, and then all those probabilities are blended at the end. So what you see is the full probabilistic spectrum um, coming out in the final number. Uh, and so it is possible that MBM 3.2, you can end up with a whole lot more weather types, um, but we will have to wait and see again. MBM 3.2 going uh, is operational February 18th. 
So with that, I will leave this open to questions. There's various ways that you can contact uh, forecast builder developers or talk about just gen generic science going in. Again, one of the things forecast builder tries to do is emulate a, a lot of the science that goes into the MBM. Uh, so there are very there is a lot of similarities between the two. Uh, so there are some various places here for for contacting. And with that, I'll thank you for viewing this presentation.